The National Constitution Center is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to increase awareness and understanding of the US Constitution among the American people on a nonpartisan basis. Uh, today is the last of our fall 2020 series of America's town hall programs, but you can find them all on our website, constitutioncenter.org and on our We the People and Live at the NCC podcasts. Um, and our live constitutional classes continue. So please tune in if you haven't yet, either your kids who are learning at home or adult learners of all ages. This Friday at 1 p.m., Kenneth Davis, the author of Don't Know Much About History, and I will discuss the foundations of American democracy. And then next Friday on December 18th, uh, I'll be talking with the wonderful Dahlia Lithwick uh, from Slate to discuss the powers of the Supreme Court. You can check out those classes at constitutioncenter.org. So, um, it is now a great pleasure to welcome you to our program tonight about whether or not uh, America should ratify the ERA. And I wanna begin by thanking the generous support of the McNulty Foundation in partnership with the Ann Welsh McNulty Institute for Women's Leadership at Villanova University. Uh, this program is part of this National Constitution Center's year-long initiative, Women and the Constitution, celebrating the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. And we're so grateful to the McNulty Foundation and the McNulty Institute for making it possible. Uh, we've got an amazing crowd tonight. Uh, I know how engaged you are. So please put your question in the Q&A box. I'll be looking at them as we talk and we'll introduce them to our panelists at the uh, right time. And now it is an honor to introduce our dream team of panelists. Uh, Jane Mansbridge is Charles F. Adams Emeritus Professor of Political Leadership and Democratic Values at Harvard University. She is the author of the award-winning Why We Lost the ERA, uh, which is the definitive book on its subject. I was sharing with Professor Mansbridge the fact that I had a copy of that book in law school and it inspired and um, uh, I, I remember it to this day, so I'm very grateful to meet her in person. Uh, she was president of the American Political Science Association and is also the author of Beyond Adversary Democracy. Carol Jenkins is president and CEO of the ERA Coalition and the Fund for Women's Equality. She hosts the Emmy-nominated interview show Black America. She is founding president of the Women's Media Center and a pioneering television reporter having worked at WNBC TV in New York for many years. And Inez felcher Stepman is senior policy analyst at the Independent Women's Forum. She previously was director of education and workforce development at the American Legislative Exchange Council. She is also senior contributor to the Federalist uh, and a Thursday editor of Bright, a woman's daily newsletter. She's also been a great guest on our We the People podcast. Thank you so much for joining us, Professor Mansbridge, Carol Jenkins, and Inez felcher Stepman. Thank you for having us. Thank you. I'm going to jump right in with Professor Mansbridge uh, with the obvious question. As uh, in, in, in as distilled a fashion as possible, uh, I'm going to ask you why the RA was lost the first time around. And I remember in particular from law school, your discussion of how the Supreme Court's decision to intervene in the Frontiero case and to grant heightened scrutiny to gender discrimination took the sails out of the political momentum for the ratification of the ERA. That's one of many crucial points you make in the book. Tell our audience why we lost the ERA. Well, I think there were three big reasons. One is just the one that you said, the Supreme Court uh, with a good deal of prodding from uh, feminist lawyers around the world, uh, around the country, um, decided to use the 14th Amendment, uh, equal protection, to accomplish many of the things that the ERA have done, and that was the Frontiero decision, and there were a set of other decisions, but primarily that one, so that when we were asked what would the ERA do, and I'm sure you're going to ask that question on this program uh, later, um, we had fewer precise things we could say, okay, it'll, it'll get rid of this horrible thing, this horrible thing, this horrible thing, because most of those uh, deep injustices had been already corrected 
using the 14th Amendment by the Supreme Court. So that was one reason that the sales, the wind had started going out of the sales. Um, another was what I uh, later called, or Lonnie Guinier uh, called, and I took it up. I wish I'd had the phrase when I wrote the book, um, but it uh, was what I, what she called the dynamic of deafness. Um, when you get involved in a social movement, you uh, give up a lot. If you if you're really if you're really working on the social movement, people don't get paid for working on social movements, and so you begin to listen primarily to the people you're working with, and you stop listening to the opposition. Um, you begin not to hear. Uh, to become a bit deaf. Uh, so we, this, the first wave of the amendment really came out of the coast, came out of Washington, D.C. The, the states, of course, were incredibly important, but a lot of the legal work and so forth was done by lawyers in Washington. Um, and so, for example, when there were only about 22% of people in the country who wanted women to be drafted on the same basis as men, now it's more than a majority, but at that point, it was only a, it was a very small number. And yet, our lawyers were saying that the ERA would send women into combat, um, would draft women and send them to combat on the same basis as men. That wasn't actually true. Um, ben Allstein and a number of other legal scholars pointed out that the Supreme Court had something called the doctrine of uh, commentators called the doctrine of military necessity. Soldiers just don't have the same rights of free speech that civilians do. Um, so the, the Supreme Court allows the military quite a bit of discretion when it comes to what the military considers military necessity. And it, it, it was just not predictable at all that the Supreme Court would have used the ERA to draft women when, when the military didn't want to do that. So, but we didn't say that because we didn't want that. We wanted women to be drafted, you know, even though 22% of the Amer only for 22% of the American public was for us. So there was a certain amount of not listening, which I think, uh, and I wrote the book in a way as a self-help manual to future uh, social movements because the feminist social movement is the most listening of almost any social movement. Um, and yet we didn't, we didn't listen very much in this case. So that was, that was in a sense, the goal of the book, this dynamic of deafness. And then a third reason really was Phyllis Schlafly. Um, you know, uh, the, the whole thing had sailed through and Phyllis Schlafly jumped in and raised all sorts of doubts, many of them unsubstantiated, some of them with some substance, but um, I, I don't think now uh, have sub substance. We'll see if later in the, in the program, we'll, have, we'll get into some discussion, I think of that. But at any rate, she raised doubts and when you, have got a system like the US system with so many veto points and you've got something like a constitutional amendment, which is designed not to get through two thirds of the, needs two thirds of both houses of the Congress, needs three quarters of the states, it's designed to be easily blocked. That's, that's how we set it up. Well then, if you design something to be easily blocked, it's relatively easy to block it. So that was built into the very structure. You raise some doubt, that's it, baby. So the, I would say those were the three reasons that Frontiero and, and the Supreme Court had already made a, a, a lot of decisions that were good ones, um, and the dynamic of deafness, um, and um, our and Phyllis Schlafly. Thank you for that wonderful and clear summary of your book, and all three of those reasons will inform the rest of our discussion as we think about the future of the ERA. The dynamic of deafness uh, for me uh, recalled Justice Ginsburg's famous uh, marital advice given by her mother-in-law, sometimes it helps to be a little deaf, by which she meant if there's <laughs> one kind word, she said, tune it out, you know, good advice on the Supreme Court. Now, Justice Ginsburg famously uh, argued that it would be best to start from the beginning, that there was enough doubt about whether when Virginia became the 38th state to ratify that the process should start again. On the other hand, uh, other uh, others uh, argue, and, and Carol Jenkins will make this case, that the uh, ratification by Virginia is sufficient to uh, make the ERA part of the Constitution. Carol Jenkins, let's begin with that procedural question. We're in a complicated place where the Department of Justice under 
uh, William Barr, has issued an opinion arguing that uh, Virginia's ratification is not sufficient to compel recognition of the amendment because there was a deadline which uh, the Justice Department held cannot be extended beyond the three-year extension that Congress granted up to 1982, and also that some states have rescinded their ratification and therefore uh, the, uh, they, they've instructed the archivist not to certify the ERA. On the other hand, several states have filed suit to compel the archivist to certify, arguing that uh, the ERA with Virginia's ratification is a valid part of the Constitution. So help us understand the why you believe that uh, the ERA should be sat certified. Right. You, and you see how complicated it is. You know, when I when there are people who say to us, just give me the short story of the ERA, you know, explain what it is and what what it will do and how it got here. Well, you know, as uh, I'm so thrilled to be with you, Jeff, and with Jane and Inez, uh, whose work I you know, respect. Uh, of course, J Jay's book is the Bible uh, for where we went wrong uh, in the 70s and 80s. Well, um, Article five of the constitution sets out two requirements for amending the constitution, which our constitution has been amended 27 times. Uh, you know, a, a really great start in the 1700s, a beginning, but clearly work needed to be done to include people and fix things that were not thought even thought of then. Uh, for instance, the fact that I'm sitting here, a black woman, a descendant of slaves, uh, you know, uh, it was not thought of, you know, when that constitution was written. So, you know, we do need uh, some uh, stipulation that says that women exist. They, you know, uh, deserve equal footing uh, in, in, in the country. And the only way we can get that, and as we, in the midst of systemic racism, sexism charges, uh, if whatever, you know, you cannot get any more systemic than the constitution, that is the playbook. That's what sets, you know, the way we live, the rights we have, the responsibilities we have. And so uh, without question, we believe at the ERA coalition that we need to fix the constitution uh, to give women uh, to, uh, the right, the rights that men have, but more than that now because of the recent Supreme Court decision, uh, so that there will be no discrimination based on sex. So the two requirements are uh, passage by Congress, and that happened in 1972, and then ratifica ratification by 38 states. And we do admit that that happened a little bit late. That happened this year. Uh, you know, the history is that. Uh, uh, you know, after, you know, the 70s and 80s, and we only got uh, up to 35 states, which I think was a miracle, you know, considering, considering if we had to do that again, you know, today, um, we got to 35 states, and then for years and years until 2017, there were no states ratified. We used to talk about the three state strategy, we needed three states in order to complete that ERA that was uh, that was in the works, and we know that in 2017, Nevada, thanks to a black uh, state legislator named Pat Spearman, uh, got Nevada to ratify that ERA. And we were sitting in our office in New York City and in D.C., and we were like, uh, "What just happened in Nevada? And does that really count?" And our lawyers who at the time, and no one really knew what was going on then because it just came right out of the blue. They said, yes. And then of course the next year, Illinois uh, ratified. And then of course it was, we only needed that one more state. And Virginia took uh, a couple of years to do it. But when it went blue uh, last year, uh, it was able to in January of 2020 ratify that ERA uh, I know that Justice Ginsburg would love us to start over again, but that ERA, now uh, almost 100 years in the works, um, we believe it was ratified on January 27th, and that's the date that we're working with. The, the, the thing that we stumble over is the timeline, what used to be called the deadline, but we like to think of it as a more of a suggestion, a time, uh, time limit. Uh, of seven and then 10, uh, ten years uh, was in the uh, what used to be called the preamble and now it's the joint resolution 
it was not something that the 38 states voted on. Uh, so that's where we believe that we are in the clear to say that we have met the requirements uh, of, of the Constitution, Article 5, those two things that are required. Of course, that time limit uh, and this uh, Department of Justice uh, and this uh, legal mem memorandum uh, have uh, stopped us and, and uh, have put us into the courts. Uh, the attorneys uh, general of the last three states that ratified uh, have, uh, of course, started a suit to compel the archivist uh, to publish the, uh, the Equal Rights Amendment. And we always say we have a great deal of sympathy for the archivist. He's the head librarian, you know, here, who probably thought he had another life in store, a career, you know, but he's the one who's responsible for uh, giving equal rights to the millions of women and, and others in this country. Um, uh, he has said that he will not publish it until uh, he is either forced to by a court or there is another memorandum. And as we all know, there's been a very, very long election that has taken place, still going on, I do believe. Uh, but we believe that we have a new president elect who has expressed um, his support of the ERA, Vice President Harris uh, elect, uh, has also uh, expressed her support of the Equal Rights Amendment. So we do think that there will be a new uh, Department of Justice uh, in 2021, and we believe that we will have an Equal Rights Amendment uh, in 2021. We I'm sure that Inez will keep us very busy once that happens, but, but we, we are expecting uh, to, to be successful. Uh, we also, the ERA Coalition, you know, there are 115 members uh, of our organizations uh, now, and uh, we work in the Senate and the House, miraculously too. Uh, in February, the House of Representatives dissolved that time limit. Uh, we're still working with Senators uh, Cardin and Murkowski, bipartisan, to do the same thing in the Senate. And the ERA is in the basement of the Senate House, as the hundreds of other bills are that have been passed by the House and, and just have not moved in the Senate. So we are preparing there uh, to dissolve the time limit. We'll have to start all over again in the House in 2021 and then do the same thing in the, in the Senate to remove... Uh, that obstacle that keeps keeps getting in our way. But the ERA is more alive than it ever has been. We are dramatically close uh, and expect uh, to, to be victorious so that, you know, all of the people who were left out in the beginning, not even thought of, uh, you know, will say that we, you know, we too uh, belong in the constitution, are in the constitution and therefore our rights, whatever they may be, and the one thing that I love about that, there's no discrimination and that this, the ERA also gives the right to write laws that will make the lives of the people in America better. And we can just go through everything. I mean, I wanna feed hungry children. I want uh, maternal health that's better. I wanna go, I wanna see the fabulous work that we can do to create the laws that will, will stop hunger, poverty, uh, and that most of the poor of this country are women. Um, so I think that it will give us a, a much better future. Thank you so much for that. Um, Inez, uh, we just heard a, a very clear explanation of an argument that the uh, ERA coalition also makes in an amicus brief filed in Commonwealth of Virginia versus uh, David Fer Ferriero, the archivist, about why the deadline that Congress initially placed in the RA should not be considered binding. And the core of the argument, as we just heard, and is also made in the brief, is that the deadline appears in the preface, but not in the text of the ERA itself. Uh, the brief actually says Congress didn't incorporate the time limit into the language of the RA itself, but inserted the time limit only in the resolving clause. At a minimum, this means Congress can change the time limit at its discretion in a subsequent joint resolution as it did by simple majority in 1978. So the argument is that at the very least, if Congress today with President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Harris's support were to extend the deadline, then that would validly extend the deadline and the archivist should ratify. Uh, the Justice Department uh, strongly disagrees. The Office of Legal Counsel has written a long memo about why the deadline should be binding. Tell us why 
uh, you agree with the Justice Department, think the deadline is binding, and believe that the ERA cannot be considered validly part of the Constitution. That's right. And um, by the way, the, the Justice Department memo also uh, takes issue with a previous memo, or at least parts of a previous memo from 1977. Um, so they actually dispute the legitimacy of the extension of the deadline the first time to, to 1982 as well. I just wanted to make that clear. Um, but, but I think that uh, fundamentally, if we t take a look at what uh, proponents like uh, Carol and others have, have argued, um, the procedure, laying aside the merits of the ERA for a moment, the procedure, they, they've set up a situation in which at least the spirit of Article 5 seems to me to be violated. Um, presumably, those uh, those barriers that Jane uh, laid out and, and all of those veto points, right, are, are there because it should be difficult to place something into the highest law of the land. And we want to make sure that there is the broadest possible base of popular support uh, for doing so, which is why the, the requirements for two thirds of Congress, why three quarters of the states, right, um, this is supposed to ensure a certain amount of popularity uh, of this idea of changing the highest law of the land. Now, if, if we go with um, all of the various legal arguments that the proponents of the ERA have advanced, one, we have a basically endless timeline um, in terms of, of the time period over which an amendment can be ratified. Now, we do have the 27th Amendment, and that was ratified uh, you know, over 200 years, <laughs> um, uh, but that is very much the outlier um, in terms of, of amendments. Um, and, and furthermore, does beg the question, right, if you have a completely different um, electorate the, the, the meaning of words changes over time. Reasons change over time, as Jane has, has chronicled a lot of the um, initial debates over what the ERA might or might not have done. A lot of the things that uh, proponents wanted the ERA to do have been done already. All of these things change the conversation. Um, and I, I think there is something fundamentally wrong with, with uh, counting those, those past ratifications um, alongside the more modern ones in, in uh, Nevada, in Illinois, and in Virginia, especially when 62% of the electorate was either not born or not old enough to vote right now, um, when the ERA was just debated and discussed in the public eye back in the 70s. Um, so that's one. And, and two, it seems to me to be a little bit unfair uh, for proponents to want to count all of the um, the ratifications in their favor, as Ruth Bader Ginsburg says, uh, but not to count the, then the uh, rescissions or, or the states that decided to rescind their um, their support for the ERA or uh, the one state that put a sunset clause in its ratification. Um, it seems to me that even if we grant the, um, the proposition that amendments can be ratified over an indeterminate amount of time, um, that, that uh, states should then have the freedom to sign on or off, uh, especially if, again, the spirit through which we're viewing this is the idea that we need to prove, not through polling, but through actual voting of representatives, um, this kind of massive popular support that is needed to amend um, the Constitution. And then finally, I alluded a little bit to my first point, but um, meaning of words, especially legally, right, is, is extremely important and it changes over time. And so, uh, for example, discrimination on the basis of sex, we have a very different um, debate or definition of sex today than we did um, in the 1970s. And so those states that ratified this amendment in the 1970s context might have thought they were ratifying something very different um, than at least what some proponents argue this amendment, um, the word sex in this amendment actually means in 2020. So for those three reasons, um, I think it's important that the procedure, procedural elements, and these will get fought out in the courts, right? There's still this very big question, not so much that the courts endorse uh, these long ratification periods. In fact, they've said that they ought to be uh, reasonably contemporaneous, um, but whether that's a question for the court to decide or whether that's a political question for Congress to decide. And I think that's where a lot of the crux of the debate um, will be. With regard to uh, the, the deadlines that, that were placed um, in, in the congressional, uh, and there's a great podcast that you, you hosted with my former professor, Sai Prakash um, at UVA Law. Um, so, um, there, there is an additional question then about whether the, these deadlines, um, the Supreme Court has upheld Congress's right to include them, but it has not ruled on the question as to whether Congress can then modify them later. So that's an additional. So there are all kinds of legal issues, procedural legal issues surrounding the ERA, and that's before we get to the substance of the merits of the amendment. Thank you very much for all that. Thank you for uh, calling out the We the People podcast. Uh, and um, uh, thanks to all for putting the procedural arguments on the table so well. 
Um, I'm going to ask uh, Lana Ulrich, our great head of content, to post in the uh, chat box uh, the brief that the ERA coalition and advocates filed in the Commonwealth of Virginia versus Ferriero case. And on the other side, the DOJ opinion by the Office of Legal Counsel, um, with, uh, which makes the arguments on the other side, and you'll have a good sense of what both of them are. All right, now we're going to turn to the substantive question. We've already we've talked about the procedure. Is the ERA now currently validly part of the Constitution? Now we'll say, uh, should it be? Uh, should the ERA be ratified, or does it deserve support? And I'm going to begin with a question uh, from the Q&A box posed by uh, Colin Thibault, who's a star student in our high school classes on the Constitution and always puts his finger on a, a central issue. And it's uh, I'm going to offer it to Professor Mansbridge. Colin asks, with the Supreme Court having recognized sex as heightened scrutiny characteristic and its rulings under the 14th Amendment, is the ERA still necessary? Professor Mansbridge, what's your response to Colin to both? I'll make a quick response to that, and then I'd like to respond just a, a little bit uh, on the issue of uh, the current situation. Um, I don't think there are any particular laws that the ERA would immediately change. I think the parallel is to the moment of the framers when they put the Bill of Rights in the Constitution. They didn't put free speech in because they thought, oh gosh, that's going to change one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine laws. They thought this is the right kind of principle to put in the Constitution. And in fact, I don't think the Supreme Court used um, that uh, clause to change any laws right anywhere near uh, when it was put in the Constitution. But it was there. And we as an Americans are very proud that we have the First Amendment in our Constitution. We're very proud of free speech. And we should be proud of an amendment that gives everybody equal rights, even if it wouldn't change a law right now. So I think that um, that's why I think it should be in the Constitution. Because when I say, um, when I end my pledge allegiance with liberty and justice to all, I want that justice to include equal rights. Um, so I, that's that's my answer to that question. But I'd like us to go back, if you, if you will, I don't think it's quite as complicated as it sounded uh, when we were going through this issue of, um, of the bringing up the ERA again. <clears throat> I think that Carol mentioned how she and a bunch of people were sitting, sort of sitting around in Washington and New York, and suddenly this stuff kind of came out of the blue. Why did it come out of the blue? Because this kid, Gregory Watson, if I can just take a minute to tell this story, he was an undergraduate at the University of Texas, he had to he would write a paper for his American government course. He was going to write a paper on, actually on the ERA because his mom was in, in now. But he went to the public library, pulled a book out about amendments that hadn't been passed. And there was the what we now call the Madison Amendment, amendment that said that if um, you have... If you make a, if you raise Congress's salary, it won't go into effect until the, after the next election. It was a way of letting the people say, we don't want to let you raise your salary. He felt, he said later that he felt that bolt of lightning hit him and he went after, after it and almost single-handedly got one state after another to ratify this amendment, which had been in the original package of the Bill of Rights and then just kind of not gotten ratified. He got one state after another to ratify it, ratify it, ratify it, ratify it, ratify it. And then it's in the Constitution, 27th Amendment. No woman had any, you know, no feminist activist had anything to do with that. And in fact, it wasn't until a couple of years later that three women at the University of Richmond in Virginia, supported by their Women's Law Association, looked at it and said, you know what? If the Madison Amendment can be uh, put in the Constitution 203 years later. So can the ERA. So that was, it, this wasn't just a, a, a vague proposition. This was a fact, a historical fact. So that's what happened. And that's why the ERA is now live again. So I just wanted to put that little piece of history in to kind of, um, to get that out to your audience. It's not that complicated. Thank you very much for the, that reminder uh, and for calling out the Madison Amendment and telling that wonderful story, which is indeed a reminder that even a, 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 a not even, but especially a student like Colin Thibault or like that great college student can change the constitution by doing research and by leading to uh, ratification. 
Uh, Carol Jenkins, I'd like you to put on the table as, as uh, vigorously as possible, your arguments for why it is necessary to ratify the ERA. Supporters uh, say that the ERA would, among other things, and I'm quoting from the New York Times summary of some of the arguments, sweep away discrimination in the workplace, help women to achieve pay equality, allow men to get paid paternity leave, require states to intervene in cases of domestic violence and sexual harassment, and guard against discrimination based on pregnancy and motherhood, as well as bolstering protections for gay and transgender people. Do you agree with some of those effects? Do you think it's, uh, those are necessary? And are there any others that you think are necessary uh, to, to uh, ratify the ERA? Well, oh, I, don't, I don't think, does it have to do all of those things in order to be valid? That's what we say. I, we never argue that you know, the world is going to be dramatically changed the day that we get the Equal Rights Amendment. I, I, I think it's a sense of, you know, the first thing that will happen is that, that children who happen, you know, to be of a different color or a different gender expression or a different, I, I mean, different, you know, will believe that they belong in this country and that they are represented by the constitution, which stipulates you know, how we run our lives uh, at this point, it doesn't exist. And so, you know, for those who say, oh, it's only symbolic, I say, okay, we'll take it. Uh, it will mean so much, even if it's only symbolic. We happen to believe that the, the ability to, to write the laws that we want to see to make lives better, are, you know, it's possible. It's not, the, the ERA is not just saying, do not discriminate. You know, it's saying, and here's this tool, you know, look at your country, decide what needs to be, what needs to be fixed uh, and, and go and do it. And so, you know, uh, so I, you know, we don't want to be held to that, that high bar that it has to do all of those things in order to be worthy. You know, why does this country treat its women so badly? You know, why did it take so long to get the vote? It was just, it was a disgrace. Why is it taking a hundred years to get an equal rights amendment? It's a scandal. You know, these are things that should not happen. You know, to be so uh, adamant that women cannot have equal rights in this country, you know, or you, or that you can't put in a, uh, an amendment in the constitution that only says you can't discriminate. You know, I know we always quote Justice Scalia, you know, who says, if you're asking me, a good friend of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, by the way, as you know, <laughs> thank you for your great book. I love it. But if you're asking me if the Constitution has anything in it that says you cannot discriminate based on sex, the answer is no. So go and do it, you know. So I think that that's what we're trying to do. But but I don't think we should be held to the, you know, to this, uh, you know, will it will it help in, in equal pay? It will ultimately, not the day after we get it, uh, you know, but every year and we know the coalition that drives me crazy that if you're talking about equal pay for women what the figures are for a black woman a latina woman has to work you know a, almost a year to make what a white man you know made uh and the numbers are not changing and here's the thing that we say about fixing the constitution in all of this time we have spent so much money so much time and energy trying to fix it and it's not fixed and it won't be fixed until you fix the reason that all of this exists and that is the constitution the the fundamental understanding of who we are who has worth it's got to change you know america has run on the cheap labor of women in its entirety the cheap labor of its slaves and black people its entirety you know the disenfranchisement of indigenous people in its entirety you know and until you know we say that we want to remedy this discrepancy the sexism racism that you know is is running wild through our country you know, in the aftermath of, of this election that, you know, that we've been through, we have to turn back to the document, you know, that everybody reveres so much and say, who's left out? Do you think we could get to the point where in 2021, you know, we would put them back in, even if it doesn't fix every single problem that we have? But anyway, you can tell that I get, a, I'm sorry, I get a little... <laughs> 
overly dramatic as as the uh, Yari Coalition staff even would say. But... Uh, not, not at all. The, the vigor of the arguments is very much appreciated, and this is a wonderful uh, discussion. Um, Inez, uh, that New York Times discussion of, of what the RA might be construed to do added, uh, imponents, opponents have argued that the amendment would, among other things, undermine family structure, intrude on religious practice, and lead to the outlawing of separate men and women's bathrooms, single college dormitories, and other accommodations. So give, give us a sense and, uh, of how you think if the RA passed, it might be construed and what changes it would wreak. Before I get to the effects of the ERA, um, I would say first that I dispute the premise, uh, and I think that maybe, maybe this is perhaps um, two important premises that underlie the arguments that Carol just made. One, I do not think that in 2020 America is a systematically sexist nation. Um, in fact, women have, uh, the, in, in, prior to the pandemic, we had the lowest unemployment rate for women since the 1950s, since we started recording those statistics. Women own the majority of wealth in this country, meaning the average net worth of um, women is higher than men, particularly towards the end of their lives because they live longer. Um, and, and women make up the majority of new small businesses opening. Again, this is all pre-pandemic. I don't know, you know what has happened in the last eight months, but um, I don't think that the, the virus um, can be blamed for, for uh, as sexist, right? So, um, and, and furthermore, women get the majority of college degrees. They get the majority of graduate degrees, right? Um, so I, I, don't, I don't see this same systemic sexism um, that Carol sees in this, in this country. And so I dispute that underlying premise and therefore dispute the need for an ERA to fix it. Um, in particular, I dispute the idea that the pay gap is, is a result of systemic sexism rather than this uh, cumulative um, result of different choices that on aggregate women make um, than men. So for example, women choose different college majors. Um, they choose different hours. They often choose more flexibility over higher pay, right? We can knock this argument back one, one step and talk about why they make those choices. Um, but but I mean, even the Obama Labor Department in 2009, when it undertook a, a massive review of all of the academic literature on this subject, concluded that active discrimination is at most, I think, something like a cent that they couldn't explain of the wage gap, i.e. the rest of the wage gap is explained by the different choices that men and women make. Um, so I, I dispute all of those underlying premises and therefore dispute that the ERA would be the fix to those things. Um, but, but further, so even, even a more conservative estimate of what the ERA might do, right, the one you'll, you'll hear talked about in legal circles versus activist circles is okay, we're going to, to raise uh, sex to heightened scrutiny, right? The same way that we deal uh, with race in the constitution, we're going to deal with sex at the exact same standard, i.e. the courts are going to be extremely suspicious without going into the different tiers of scrutiny and stuff, but extremely suspicious um, and require a, a, a absolutely ironclad reason um, for a state to, to treat men and women differently under the law, the same way that it requires an extremely high standard in all um, cases, in fact, except for affirmative action, which is controversial, um, to treat, the law cannot treat, you know, um, black citizens differently from white citizens, differently from, from Asian citizens, right? Um, there is rightly a very high tier of scrutiny for that, and the courts are suspicious of laws that discriminate on the basis of race. Um, sex, I would argue, is fundamentally different from race in, in the fact that there are real biological differences between men and women. Um, first of all, obviously the physical, right? Um, we, are, we are smaller, we are on average weaker, um, and these things have consequences. Now, not, um, you know, they don't have consequences as to who can be an astronaut, perhaps, or, or who can be, um, you know, the next Marie Curie, uh, but they do have limited consequences that then have to be recognized by the law. So I'll give you one example of a consequence where heightened scrutiny exactly resulted um, in, in an a outcome that I think would be really disastrous for women. So uh, the Supreme Court has held that heightened scrutiny has to uh, apply to any kind of discrimination on the basis of race within the prison system. So um, even though there, there is very good evidence, for example, that um, you know, segregating prisons by race and racial gangs does decrease violence because you have less interaction in prison between rival gangs. So there is very good evidence that in fact, it does lower violence nevertheless, the Supreme Court said that's not a good enough reason, right? They kicked it back down to the lower courts and said, no, you have to apply heightened scrutiny. Even in this case, it is such an important principle 
under our constitution that the, the state cannot discriminate on the basis of race, that we're even going to say, you cannot, you cannot use that tool to even to mitigate violence in the prisons. Well, what, what happens when, when sex is, is uh, you know, considered at the same level of scrutiny, right? Do we have mixed men's and women's prisons? It seems to me that the physical weaknesses of women in comparison to men make women uniquely vulnerable if they were to be put in with male inmates in prison. Um, but according to the way we've treated race in this question, and if we were to raise sex at the same level, that would not be considered a good enough reason to keep separate men's and women's prisons, which after all is a discrimination on the basis of sex. And that's just the, the tip of the iceberg in terms of, of the laws that recognize these very real differences between men and women that again, you know, might not matter in, you know, a certain academic context, they don't matter in, let's say, 99% of situations in life, um, but they matter enormously in certain types of situations. So again, for example, public universities have um, sports teams, right? They have generally male and female sports teams. We are having this huge debate over, um, you know, what to do with a small number of people who are born one sex and identify as the other, right? So, um, but but the ERA, in my view, would would sort of uh, would would make that debate uh, sort of irrelevant because it wouldn't matter whether you know somebody identifies as, as which sex. It would just be I'm a boy. I want to run on the women's track team uh, because perhaps I my score doesn't qualify for the men's track team, but it does um, you know beat out all of the women's scores on the women's track team. I am being kept out of, from this team exclusively because of my sex as a man, um, that's a discrimination based on sex and an ERA would, would make that a, a viable constitutional challenge. And in fact, that's, that's not pie in the sky speculation because we've actually seen it happen in Massachusetts. There's a case in 1979 in Massachusetts that, that uh, bases the ability of a boy to then join the women's team, particularly if, if that sport is not available um, to boys it, it says that, that the Athletic Association for Public Schools cannot uh, forbid boys from joining the girls' team on the basis of the ERA in that state. So again, state-level ERA. Um, so you know, the consequences of this seems to me could be very, very radical. Um, sure, we're going to have to see how courts interpret it. They may interpret it narrowly, but even that narrow interpretation, which would be raising it to heightened scrutiny and not you know, sort of um, fomenting an entirely new branch of law um, underneath uh, the ERA, just, just sort of um, you know, putting sex on par with race in the constitution, which is sort of the baseline um, that a lot of legal scholars and proponents say the ERA will do. Even that I think will have a very substantial and, and oftentimes very negative consequences for women and girls when those actual sex differences are no longer able to be recognized by the law. Thank you very much for that. And thanks to all for joining the substantive debate so well. Uh, Professor Mansbridge, as you've just heard, there is a vigorous disagreement among your co-panelists about how broadly the ERA might be construed and also whether the broad construction would be a good thing or not. What can we learn from history? Uh, in a review of the Mrs. America miniseries, you wrote a piece for the American Prospect saying that one of the lessons of the ERA is to try today to avoid the, uh, the dynamic of deafness, deafness. And uh, remember that the ERA movement in the 70s was truly a political movement from the ground up and that social change requires that kind of mobilization. How would you advise um, uh, young women who were trying to achieve uh, goals uh, of the, they believe the ERA would achieve today, should they focus on ratification of the amendment, on the, making arguments in court, or on political activism, or on all of those things? Um, uh, the head of the Women's Christian uh, Temperance Union uh, once said when she was working to get the vote, and it was her work, uh, and the work of the Women's Christian Temperance Union that had a great effect on bringing women the vote. Uh, when asked what strategies the different, the organization should take, she said, we have a do everything program. And that meant if you were in Wyoming, do what's right for Wyoming. If you're in New York, do what's right for New York. If you're in Maine, do what's right for Maine. So I would say, uh, just like Francis Willard, we should have a do everything program. People should work for women's rights 
in every way they possibly can. Sometimes that'll mean that uh, they're in a position to try to get their state to ratify the ERA. Um, but I, the other thing I said in that American Prospects article uh, was that about the dynamic of deafness. Let's be realistic about what the court will do. Will the court actually send women into combat on the same basis of men? No, it won't. Will the court actually say that women have to share prison cells with men? No, it won't. Uh, will the court force with teams? No. Amy Barrett just joined the court. She's 48 years old. She's going to be on that court for a long time. She's not going to make that decision. So let's be a little realistic about what's actually going to happen. And let's take a look at the ERA as something that we put in the Constitution so that just the way people say now, um, I have my right to free speech. You can't tell me what to do. Actually, that's, that's not true. A worker doesn't have a right to free speech in the factory. Um, that's about uh, that phrase. That's about uh, state action. But what it makes people feel throughout the United States is I have free speech. And they say to somebody, I have free speech. And so a girl can say, I have my equal rights. And she will say, I have my equal rights. And that's how we'll get our equal rights is because she will stand up for them and she'll stand up for them because the principles in the constitution. So. Thank, thank you very much uh, for that and for that uh, historical argument for an all prongs approach and for your thoughts about how the ERA is likely in practice to be interpreted if it were to be ratified by the courts today. Well, the Q&A box is just full of the most uh, wonderful and relevant questions. There are so many, and I'll just offer a couple to uh, each of you, uh, Carolyn, Inez, uh, and then we'll have uh, closing arguments. We have a uh, question asking, how would the intent of the ERA be determined uh, today? Uh, would it be the intent of the people who introduced it in 1972 or the ratifiers uh, in uh, uh, 2021 or somewhere in between? And we have a question asking whether if the error is passed, would that mean a woman could be drafted? And then uh, another question, how would the ERA affect interpretations of the Equal Protection Clause under the 14th Amendment? And just, just to put that legal um, bit of uh, doctrine on the table, the Supreme Court in, in the Virginia Military Institute opinion that Justice Ginsburg wrote said that uh, gender-based classifications need an exceedingly persuasive justification. The RA would, would require that they have a compelling governmental interest, which is a higher tier of scrutiny. So uh, Carol, recognizing that you think that the effect would not be radical, um, in what cases would it actually make a difference? Well, I think that uh, I'm, I'm with uh, Professor Mansbridge on, on this that, that we will need to, you know, to see. I mean, I do believe uh, I think that that it would have to be where we are in 2021. Uh, you know, that as opposed to back in the 1970s, we were living in a completely different, you know, world with a set of uh, set of expectations. Uh, but I think that that is uh, to be, you know, uh, to be determined, and 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 we are you know, completely happy to and expect that whatever, that we are moving to the courts and that, that issues will be just decided, you know, there, you know, once uh, we have equal rights, uh, completely willing to carry that all the way, you know, if it goes to the Supreme Court, as some say that it will, you know, we think that they probably would not take it up, you know, because it would be too much of a political, you know, action, and the, you know, they would throw it back to Congress, and they would have to, you know, decide decide it. Um, but, but I, you know, I think we we don't we don't know that much. I know Inez has. Uh, I've listened to her wonderful podcast about that. If you want, you know, to take that, you know, take your position up on on that point. Uh, th th thank you for all all, all that. Uh, Inez, I will ask a few questions to you from the Q&A box uh, too. Um, in the Bostock case, uh, our great student Colin asks again, the Supreme Court recognized that Title VII of the Civil Rights Act protects LGBTQ people from employment discrimination. 
would the ERA's prohibition of equal rights under law on account of sex extend to members of that community and, and uh, how would that change uh, existing protections under Bostock? And then we have uh, questions about whether um, if the ERA is passed, would that mean that a woman could be drafted? Um, give us some more specific examples of changes that the ERA would affect if it were ratified. Sure. So with regard to Bostock, um, yes, I, I do think that um, the analysis of Title VII would be instructive. I don't know how, again, how judges would uh, interpret it and how much of that would be, that analysis would be imported into the ERA. Um, but it's important to remember that under Bostock, there wasn't actually a, a quote unquote SOGI finding, right? It wasn't, um, there, there wasn't a, a finding that uh, gender identity or expression was protected by Title VII. In fact, Neil Gorsuch's opinion um, reads Title VII and its, its prohibitions uh, against discrimination on the basis of sex, just like the ERA, um, as including such things as, um, you know, if, if, for example, a biological man wants to wear the uniform in, in a um, place of business that is normally um, intended for female employees, um, he can't be fired for that because it's a discrimination on the basis of sex, i.e. if he were a biological female wearing the skirt, then he wouldn't have been fired. But because he is a biological male wearing the skirt, um, it's a discrimination on the basis of sex. So they didn't actually find um, that, that gender identity as a whole was protected under Title VII. They found exactly that kind of discrimination on the basis of sex that the ERA prohibits. So to that extent, I do think a lot of the Bostock analysis would be imported into, um, you know, potentially imported into the ERA. Um, in terms of, of other policy consequences, once you think beyond the immediate state law, which I talked about before with regard to, you know, public school bathrooms, public school locker rooms, um, public school sports teams, public university dorms, all of those things, um, and then, of course, prisons, and once you think of beyond that circle, there's the question of whether any institution that accepts federal money um, would be, uh, you know, pulled in to court cases under the ERA. So, for example, battered women's shelters often accept either local, state, or federal money, um, and and a lot of them are uh, women only, right? For obvious reasons, these are women who have been traumatized by domestic violence, and they don't want to stay in um, a room with with men um, while they're fleeing to these shelters. And again, we're, we're seeing a lot of these issues come up with regard to the transgender context. But in that context, we're essentially talking about, you know, what accommodations we want to make for people who are a, represent a small number of exceptions. Um, whereas under the ERA, we're talking about it in a much broader sense, right? Um, any, any kind of sex segregated environment certainly a sex segregated environment that is directly linked to government and state action, but even perhaps a uh, private institution that then gets some threshold amount of money or perhaps could not operate without federal, state, or local money, um, that opens an entire can of worms as well. So um, I think there are consequences there. Also, there are laws, um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg said there, there are potentially you know, hundreds or even thousands of laws right on the books that in some way recognize the distinction between men and women. Um, and, and sometimes they do so without explicitly naming men and women. And, and um, Justice Ginsburg thought that that in itself, that kind of um, renaming, right? So for example, the, the um, Special Social Security Act, which, is, uh, which was originally exclusively for women for wives to then draw spousal social security benefits on their husband's um, their, their husband's work right um, decades of work paying into the system um, that was originally a program intended for women uh, but is now relabeled as gender neutral Justice Ginsburg was looking askance at some of those laws saying they are in fact a cover for a subsidy to a particular sex and therefore a violation of what she called the equality principle. Uh, similarly, we have programs like WIC, Women and Infant Children, right? So um, even if those laws were rewritten to be theoretically gender neutral or sex neutral, um, they still would be drawn into some of these court cases depending on how the Supreme Court interprets this, how broadly they interpret it. And, and here I, I do wanna respond perhaps to something that, that Jane said, 
you know, all of these policy issues are contentious and being resolved by the electorate. And electorate, by the way, which is majority female in all modern elections, i.e. not just the there are more female registered voters, but there are more actual female voters in nearly every modern election um, for, for the last several decades. I'm sure Jane um, can, can give me the precise numbers on exactly yeah. when the last time it was uh, that, that men, men um, outvoted women uh, in, in elections. And it's, it's just not convincing to me to say that we need to remove all of these issues, even potentially from this electorate, from Americans voting and, and working out in the normal you know, process of, of public policy and legislation on both the, the, you know, the, on the local and state level and on the federal level. We need to potentially take all of these issues out of their hands um, and put it into the judiciary, which, yeah, you're, you're right. Um, you know, the current Supreme Court is unlikely to interpret this law particularly broadly. Perhaps they interpret it in line with current equal protection doctrine. But current equal protection doctrine does allow um, a certain amount of flexibility exactly for some of the issues that I've pinpointed. There is no guarantee that the ERA, on the face of it, which, I mean, the, the face of it prohibits these kinds of things that um, I've been saying about, you know, segregated prisons, sex segregated prisons, and, and so on. Um, on the face of the language, the ERA prohibits those things. Now, maybe courts, you know, have a narrow reading that allows some of those things, but that won't, won't always be the case, right? Um, and I'm not willing to just accept as a solution we take all of these issues out of this, this electorate, we take it out of a vigorous public debate, we place it in the courts where it's extremely difficult to change. Um, and, and so I, I, that, that argument is just not, not convincing to me that the fact that it might be temporarily read narrowly because of the particular composition of the Supreme Court at this moment in time, um, that, that for similar reasons as I think proponents would like to put it in to the Constitution, I, I would argue against putting it into the Constitution because once you do that, there's very little going back and it's very, very difficult for the American public if they don't like the consequences of that amendment to then you know, remove it. Like the only instance we have of that, of course, is prohibition. So um, I, I, that, that's why that argument is not particularly convincing to me. Thank you so much for those uh, thoughtful concluding thoughts and friends are one uh, rule at the Constitution Center as at the Supreme Court is that we have to end on time. So we're going to do that. And I will conclude first by urging all of you to continue to educate yourself about the 19th Amendment. Uh, you can do that on the National Constitution Center's interactive constitution. There is the most exciting interactive we've just posted that includes an interactive map that helps you see how women's suffrage at the state level paved the way for the 19th Amendment and also the debates, these really exciting audio clips of the range of arguments that were advanced in the long fight for women's suffrage, and as well as the drafting table. Oh, this is so cool. We've put on the early drafts of the 19th Amendment, and you can explore how they evolved over time, as well as early drafts of the ERA. And then, of course, you can make up your own mind, uh, as is your privilege and responsibility as a learner about the Constitution. Um, and with that, I will thank very sincerely our superb panelists, uh, Jane Mansbridge, Carol uh, Jenkins, and uh, uh, Inez. Um, I am so grateful to all of you for having uh, made your arguments with such distinction and educated our um, audience about the Constitution. Jane's Man Jane Mansbridge, Carol Jenkins, Inez Felcher, Stepman, thank you so much for joining and Thank everyone. You. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks to you all. Have a great night, everyone. Thanks for the great questions. Happy holidays. And we look forward to seeing you early in 2021.